What's up, Danny Joe and Jazz ladies out there? This is your boy, Sasha Rojo, broadcasting live from the cabaret in the sky. And when I'm not busy doing my soloing on my two horn, I just tune in to the Olympics presents We All Be News and Radio. Somebody do that, 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 We all be booked. The education of a black radical makes it plain on what it means to be young, gifted, and black in America. By R two C two H two Dardivis. When you start measuring somebody, measure him right. Make sure you done take into account what hills and valleys he come to before he got wherever he is. The rain has buried. Judge Bailey is a man of both word and action. He is a truly impressive man, a man of the people as well as one who is self-made. In the tradition of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, the education of a black radical, the first of a three-book offering centered around the life story of Judge D. Army Bailey, the man who saved the Lorraine Motel, and founded the National Civil Rights Museum, offers a riveting glimpse via a colorful and page-turning narrative into the life of a dynamic young black man turned freedom fighter, turned civil rights leader. Judge Bailey does a masterful and nuanced job of introducing the reader to what Jim Crow's life was like in a medium-sized southern town such as Memphis, Tennessee. However, Memphis is of course no regular sleeping southern town. It is arguably the epicenter of America's cultural crossroads, the place where the blues and R&B gave or give birth to rock and roll. Case in point, Bailey states that Johnny Ace, arguably the first rock and roll star ever, was a neighbor of his in his close-knit South Memphis neighborhood. In giving us an insider look into the inner workings of his early childhood, one could see the benefits of a black child growing up in a segregated, yet strong, proud, and thriving community in the Jim Crow South. Economically, it benefited blacks due to the fact that many were forced to pursue entrepreneurial efforts in order to provide goods and services for the community, thus providing for a recycling of the black dollar rarely seen today. Bailey's industrious paternal grandfather seemed at ease in this environment as he is the proprietor of Bailey's Stand, a mini grocery store, as well as a successful housing contractor who was able to pay for the early private education of his grandson. What makes these feats even more amazing is that his grandfather is functionally illiterate. Bailey's father is a well-traveled and well-read home reporter and chess master, while his mom is described as a resourceful and highly intelligent Renaissance woman with several engaging careers, including that of nurse. Bailey does an excellent job of also adding flesh and bone to legends in the Memphis black community, such as education giants Blair T. Hunt and Nat D. Williams, both of Booker T. Washington High School. By growing up in an environment with such role models, it is easy to see where Bailey gets his trademark confidence from. Bailey does an exceptional job of showing his evolution from observer to participant in the burgeoning modern American civil rights movement. What is really intriguing is his incubation period at Southern University. Towards the end of his tenure at the prestigious institution, 
Bailey grows into a rebel with a cause, causing the attention, or rather catching the attention and loading of the school's president, as well as a, of the Louisiana State Board of Education apparatus. Bailey's activism also gets him the attention and disdain of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, something he won't fully become aware of until years later because of the Freedom of Information Act. Bailey should be considered a demonstrative as well as a definitive man of his times in the annals of a people's history. The people he called his comrades in arms reads like a who's who of power players and modern of both the civil rights and student movements, respectfully. From Dave Dennis, Diane Nash, Ella Baker, James Meredith, to Bob Zelda, Congressman Barney Frank, Reverend James Reed, Mickey Swerner, and Abby Hoffman, Bailey draws you into his coming of age story. Freedom songs, marches, sit-ins, and all. Another highlight of the book comes in the chapter entitled The Original X-Men which is, of course, about the one and only Malcolm X and the time that Bailey arranged for the controversial black leader to speak at predominantly white Clark University. His new school after Southern University expelled him in Worcester, Massachusetts. Bailey does a superb job of painting the oftentimes polarizing Malcolm in all of his complexities and splendor. He makes it plain that when it comes to Malcolm, there are no in-between. You either love or hate him. But in the end, all must respect him. Just reading the words in this chapter, one can envision Malcolm's devious grin, hypnotizing intellect, and stare, as well as charming wit, dripping from every page. In conclusion, I must say that I was pleasantly surprised in reading Judge Bailey's magnum opus. It gives me a greater appreciation for the achievements as well as of the man that I have known as a dear friend for most of my life. This is a must-read book for all students of the American Civil Rights Movement as well as those interested in organizing young people to take up the call once again for this and future generations to come. Although Bailey's generation were able to plant the seeds of change which has allowed for the rise of our 44th U.S. President being a black man, the struggle continues. The book is very accessible and should be required reading for young people, especially those students in inner city schools and communities.